Good evening, everyone, and welcome once again to Bhagavad Gita Satsang. I'm Hari Kirtan, and it is a pleasure for me to be here with you, an honor to know that you are here with me. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. It's very nice to see you all here. And speaking of hearing, uh, if you would be kind enough to let me know that you can hear me by just raising your hands. Thank you very much. It is nice to know that I am being heard. We'll take care of our usual housekeeping for those of us uh, who are new to the satsang. You can adjust your audio settings and your viewing options up in the upper right hand corner. No need to worry about your microphone or video camera. You can see and hear me, but I cannot see or hear you. But you can make your presence felt to me by popping a question or comment into the Q&A box at any time. So I will be keeping my eye on that. If at any point during the course of the proceedings you have something to ask or something to add, I would be very, very happy to see your question or comment pop up in the Q&A box. Our last class, Chapter 8, The Yoga of Attaining the Supreme. We looked at the Gita's calculations of time and space, which were pretty far out and a little different from what we may be accustomed to in our modern Western calculation of such things. The transmigration of souls on a cosmic scale as opposed to an individual scale, as Krishna spoke about earlier, the big picture of how all living beings move uh, up and down throughout different species of life, throughout different planetary systems in the material world, throughout different universes, even in the uh, material cosmic manifestation, uh, and how one can take a one-way trip out of the whole system of transmigration over the course of time to the one supreme destination. We covered verses 15 through 22 of chapter eight. This evening, we will finish chapter eight with verses that deal with knowing when it's time to go. Always good to know when it's time to go. Verses 23 through 28, We'll cover this topic and summarize the chapter. We will look back at the whole chapter to put the whole thing in context. So that's our plan. But first, we will chant our invocation mantra. The dot over the N indicates closing one's lips and the back of one's tongue to the roof of one's mouth at the same time. The bars over the A's indicate an open ah sound rather than a short uh sound. So I chant, you chant back. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And on with the show. Last week's last verse, where we left off. O Partha, Arjuna, the Supreme Person, the greatest of all, who enters into everything and within whom all the worlds reside, is attainable by unalloyed devotion. So we left off with one of the paradoxical aspects of the Supreme Person, which is to say that the Paramatma, the Supreme Atma, enters into everything, every atomic particle of matter in the hearts of all living beings. And at the same time, all the worlds reside within this same Paramatma, this same person. And one can attain this person by unalloyed devotion. As we look back, we will see that um, not just attainable, but easily attainable by unalloyed devotion, which is quite remarkable. Which brings us to this week's verses. 
So we will run through the translations and then go back and take a look at the details of each verse. So beginning now with text number 23 of the eighth chapter. O best of the Bharatas, I shall now describe the times at which different kinds of mystics depart from this world, either to return once again or never to return. Texts 24 and 25 together. Those who know the absolute reality attain that supreme absolute by leaving this world under the influence of fire and light. Within the six months when the sun follows a northern path, during the bright fortnight of the waxing moon and at an auspicious time of day. The mystic who leaves this world under the influence of smoke and darkness within the six months when the sun follows a southern path and during the waning lunar fortnight attains the light of the moon but returns once again. Text 26. These two means of passage from this world, one in light and one in darkness, are known to be primeval. By one, one does not come back. By the other, one returns. Text 27. These two paths do not bewilder a mystic who knows them. Therefore, O Arjuna, remain firmly situated in union with the Supreme. And text 28. With such a complete understanding, a mystic transcends the fruits to be obtained by the study of the Vedas, the performance of sacrifice, the observance of austerities, and the giving of charitable gifts, and reaches the supreme original abode. So there is your conclusion for the chapter. So let's go back and take a closer look. So starting with verse 23. O best of the Bharatas, I shall now describe the times at which different kinds of mystics depart from this world, either to return once again or never to return. So this is kind of an interesting idea that continues on a fair amount of what this chapter has been about, which is leaving one's body. From the standpoint of yoga, death means leaving one's body. And a lot of this chapter has been about the state of mind that one should practice being in or the state of being one should cultivate during one's life in order to be in a particular state of mind at the time of death. Now, given the idea that one can voluntarily leave one's body at the time of one's choosing, which is a pretty neat mystic yoga capability, uh, we find that there are auspicious times for leaving this world in order to obtain a destination from which one need not return. And then another time that's suitable for leaving this world if one is less interested in liberation and more interested in attaining temporary material enjoyment. Krishna has already gone on record as saying that's not actually a very good idea from his point of view because it's temporary. But just the same, uh, for someone who is a karma yogi and is practicing yoga for the purpose of being elevated to a higher status of life or a higher status of uh, material enjoyment, you know, that, that may just be the idea, that may be what they want. The jnana yogis, the yogis who are on the path of knowledge are interested in attaining Brahman. That is to say, merging into the spiritual effulgence of the Supreme Person 
uh, the undifferentiated oneness or the spiritual energy. And we're going to come back as we review the chapter to our definition of Brahman. The mystic yogis uh, may also want to merge into this oneness or uh, attain realization of the Paramatma. And the devotional yogis are on a different track, as we'll see in just a moment. So in 24, um, now that Krishna has set the stage for how a perfect a, a yogi who has perfected their practice can select the time and situation for leaving the material world, um, the first option, those who know the absolute reality, attain the supreme absolute, by leaving this world under the influence of fire and light, within the six months when the sun follows a northern path, during the bright fortnight of the waxing moon, at an, aus an auspicious time of day. So, keeping in mind earlier, we heard that the uh, mind carries one uh, on the path to their new life. And if one leaves their body at the time, this particular designated time, uh, either on purpose or accidentally. This, this could be just your good fortune that you happen to leave at an auspicious time. Uh, it is possible to attain liberation, which is to say um, that state beyond the influence of the material world and uh, become situated in Brahman. Now, some people say that indeed, once liberated, one never returns. There are others who say that even those who are liberated into this Brahman or Brahma Jyoti uh, have the experience of spiritual unity and yet will still eventually come back uh, by virtue of lack of engagement. This corresponds to the idea that heaven is a place where nothing ever happens. And so that's one way to think about this. Here, Krishna seems to be saying there's, uh, there's no need to return. And one, in fact, does not. Anyway, I've heard uh, a couple of different angles of vision on this. And if any of you have heard uh, something that speaks to this point, I'd be curious to hear about that. So when fire, light, day, and the fortnight of the moon are mentioned, the, there's a, a metaphorical significance to this as well. Because these objects are associated uh, with uh, time and indicate different cosmic deities who preside over these objects. So there's Agni, uh, who is the deity who presides over fire, um, and uh, another deity who is uh, in charge of light and the sun and such like that. So the idea here is that there is a representational significance to this description, indicating that the yogi gets assistance from deities in charge of different aspects of the material world as they make their way from the material body that they are leaving to their destination, in this case, beyond the material world. So it's nice to know that you get help. The next verse, the mystic who leaves this world under the influence of smoke and darkness within the six months when the sun follows a southern path and during the waning lunar fortnight attains the light of the moon but returns once again. So that's a very interesting phrase there, attains the light of the moon. So here's the idea behind this. The universe is understood to be a multidimensional place. Uh, in the Vedas and the Vedic literature. And 
our very our senses have a very narrow bandwidth of perception so we don't see everything that's around us even when it's right in front of us and the moon is one of those things that we don't see in its entirety according to the vedic version which is to say that you know certainly we see a, a moon globe circling the earth uh, and by all accounts there's nothing there i mean like really nothing just uh, gray and a little bit of yellow dust and and uh pock marks there is another dimension to the moon according to the vedic version where there's a very high standard of material enjoyment going on and we simply do not have access to that aspect of the moon so sometimes uh <laughs> uh yes a lot like marvel's universe in, uh, in in so many ways um yeah uh certainly dr strange is in charge of making sure the dimensions of the universe that most normal humans have access to is not uh, impinged upon by beings who have access to the many other dimensions. Uh, Thor has a little bit of responsibility in this respect as well. Um, so according to the Vedic version, uh, one who is a karma yogi can engage in really, really good karma in order to attain a temporary residence on the moon planet, Chandraloka, and enjoy a very, very high standard of material enjoyment for 10,000 years by the calculations of the cosmic deities or demigods. Um, basically, it's just a very, very high and classy standard of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And eventually, you run the table on your good karma and you take birth once again back on the middle planetary system or planet Earth. And you get a human life again. And now you have to either refill your bank account or risk actually heading into a downward spiral into a lower species of life. Or maybe you become a yogi once again and decide that as good as it gets on the moon, it's still not good enough to merit having to continue in the cycle of birth and death and you uh, aspire to practice yoga and leave uh, at the other time. Speaking of uh, the other time, we proceed to the next verse where Krishna says, these two means of passage from this world, one in light and one in darkness, are known to be primeval, which is to say the idea that you can do this uh, has always been around. This is Vedic knowledge. The Vedas are understood to be the breath of Vishnu. They are imparted to Brahma at the very beginning of the universe. Therefore, Vedic knowledge has been extant in the material world since the very beginning. And therefore, this idea or this technology of yoga and this strategy for leaving one's body in a particular way at a particular time for a particular purpose has always been known. Not as well known now as it used to be, I suppose. By one path, one does not come back. The first path, the departure under the influence of light. By the other, one returns. The path of departure under the influence of darkness. This idea of these two paths and these two different results from taking these two paths is also spoken of in the uh, Chandogya Upanishad. So the Bhagavad Gita is understood to be a summary study of the Upanishads. So it is not so surprising 
that we would find corresponding verses in various Upanishads. Uh, and this is one example of just such a, an instance. Verse 27. These two paths do not bewilder a mystic who knows them. Therefore, O Arjuna, remain firmly situated in union with the Supreme. So, as Krishna has described in some of the preceding verses, uh, there is no fear of returning, irrespective of leaving at this time or that time or the other time. There's no other time. There's this time or that time. Um, in other words, whether the moment is auspicious or inauspicious, uh, by accident or by arrangement, one who is situated in union with the Supreme uh, will go to the Supreme. The Sanskrit word that's significant in this particular verse is yoga yukta, that is to say linked through yoga. Uh, and one who is constantly situated in a state of divine consciousness, no matter what they are doing, uh, is in a situation where they can rise above this choice of this path or that path. So in Arjuna's case, uh, he is being encouraged to engage in a fight to the death while maintaining a state of divine consciousness, of meditation on the Supreme Person, on Krishna. And not only meditating on the Supreme Person while he's fighting, but seeing his duty, his engagement in the battle as a sacrifice, as an offering, as something done as a service to divine will. All right, so how does this apply to us? Well, we have things to do, places to go, people to be, and uh, almost all of it, almost everything that we do can be connected to a spiritual purpose as opposed to a material purpose. The difference being that we see everything as a transformation of spiritual energy that belongs to the source of that energy. And therefore, we see everything as properly utilized when it is engaged in the service of the source of the energy. This is called yukta vairagya. Yukta, once again, linking vairagya through appropriate uh, detachment or appropriate renunciation, which is to say that uh, a bhakti yogi doesn't simply dismiss the material world as an illusion, something that's not real, and therefore something to be abandoned in favor of the real reality of Brahma. But rather, one who is engaged in devotional yoga sees the material world as a transformation of spiritual energy and therefore spiritualizes everything that one does uh, by using everything for this higher spiritual purpose of service to the Supreme Person. This is another extension or practical application of Ishvara Pranidhana in the Yoga Sutras, uh, offering one's life force or one's life breath, meaning that you don't become inactive. It is not just a matter of some high level pranayama, but rather it is higher level engagement with the world uh, by maintaining a state of mental connection and reinforcing that mental connection externally by engaging with the world in a spiritual context. So a yogi who dedicates every action and connects every uh, material necessity of life. You know, we have to work, we have to maintain ourselves, um, we have various responsibilities. You know, we don't 
over endeavor for that which is difficult to attain. But during the course of a simple life that prioritizes spiritual attainment, uh, we dovetail everything uh, to this one overarching spiritual goal and direct our consciousness to the Supreme Person while we are so engaged. And in this way, uh, we are not bewildered or disturbed by the prospect of leaving our body at this time or another time or just doesn't matter. So if anyone has any questions about this, uh, what we've talked about up to this point, please go ahead and ask them or any comments that you may have about what we've spoken about so far. This verse about how these two paths do not bewilder a mystic who knows them echoes the sentiments Krishna has expressed in the 14th verse earlier in the chapter, uh, where he says, O son of Krita, for one whose mind is continually immersed in remembrance of me, who is united with me through constant absorption in me, I am easy to obtain. Which is another way of saying, you don't have to go through all the trouble of leaving at this particular time or that particular time, nor does it matter if you happen to leave at this particular time or that particular time. By virtue of that constant absorption, you're pretty much guaranteed to go to wherever Krishna is. Which brings us to the last verse. This is the one we're going to chant this evening. So let me go back to sharing my screen with you. Okay. So this verse, 28, the dots under the S's uh, indicate an SH sound. The tilde over the end uh, after the J turns the J into more of a semi-hard G sound rather than a soft J sound, uh, yeah. The dot under the H uh, only really changes the pronunciation if the dot appears at the end of a word at the end of a line. Uh, what else do we have here? <laughs> I think that's it. Oh, the C and the last word in the first line will be a CH sound. And I will chant the first line and every other line, but I'll give you time to chant it back. So one line at a time. I chant, you chant back. Here we go. Vedeshu jagyeshu tapasu chaiva. Taneshu yat punya palam pradishtam. At yeti tat sarvami dam vidhitva. Yogi param sthanam upaiti chadyam. So there is actually one more thing I can explain about the transliterated Sanskrit that we're chanting, uh, or that we're referencing for chanting. The H after a preceding consonant, as in the word palam, the fourth word in the second line, and sthanam, the third word in the fourth line. There's no TH sound like the or hatha yoga in Sanskrit. You pronounce every letter, so the PH sound does not become a F sound, but rather a P sound. You put some air after the P. Similarly, with the H after the T, it doesn't become a sthanam, but rather sthanam. So H's mean air as opposed to joining with uh, another letter to create a whole different sound. 
And let's see what Shanna has to say. My translation has a note in verse 25 that reads, fire, light, smoke, light, etc." probably represents stages of the soul's experience after death. Thus light may symbolize knowledge and smoke ignorance. Hmm, curious, I'd be interested to know uh, what translation you have. So uh, if you can tell me who the translator is or what edition that is, I, I would love to see that. Um, so this is um, commentary on verse 25, which uh, was, or 25 and 26 were the two paths uh, that you can go during the day or during the night, during the waning, uh, waxing or waning moon. So in this commentary, I think the key word is probably, indicating that the commentator is guessing. I'm not usually so inclined to uh, commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita that are not relying on a traditional lineage of teachers or a, un, an understanding that, that comes from an authoritative source. So this sounds like speculation to me, just simply by virtue of the word probably being in there. Now, let's see if there's a kernel of truth behind the probably. Well, if the objects, light, smoke, etc., are indicating that there are different deities in charge of different material elements or matters of cosmic affairs that are assisting the yogi who is en route to their next destination, then there is some logic to this that the passage would not be instantaneous, but rather would go through stages, which is to say that if you get on the train in New York and you're going to Chicago, then there might be a few stops on the way. Eventually you will get to Chicago because you're on the train to Chicago. But that does not mean you get on the train in New York and a minute later, uh, you are directly in Chicago. There's a way that one gets to Chicago from New York. So similarly, there, uh, it's logical if we accept this proposition that <clears throat> there is a passageway and that at different points along the way you are getting assistance from different uh, demigods, then it makes sense that there would be stages of the soul's experience of the journey from the present material body to their next destination, whether it be Brahman or the moon, wherever they're going. So there is some uh, logic to this and therefore I will uh, stipulate to the logic in spite of the word uh, probably. Thank you for giving me your source. Um, and I'm gonna take a second just to make a note of that so that I can uh, look this up for myself, notes, make a note. This is called a dramatic pause. Shanna, thank you very much. Uh, I will take a look at that as soon as I get a chance. And uh, uh, yes, a super old school translation. Oh, okay. Uh, I will look for that uh, for that picture, um, and and look up that edition. Thank you very much. Okay, back to our screen share.
And having chanted our verse, we will go on to the translation. With such a complete understanding, a mystic transcends the fruits to be obtained by the study of the Vedas, the performance of sacrifice, the observance of austerities, and the giving of charitable gifts, and reaches the supreme original abode. So we have this particular word here, original. The origin point of everything else and our own original station in our existence. So the word sthanam specifically means an abode, a place. So there's a place to go. Uh, there's a place for us. Sounds like West Side Story. There's a natural original place for us, and that place is the spiritual world, the abode of Krishna. So this verse is a summation of both the seventh and eighth chapters, uh, which particularly deal with meditation on the Supreme Person uh, and the activities by which, or the means by which one attains the Supreme Person and goes to the abode of the Supreme Person. So these chapters that we're in now focus on bhakti, the central matter, subject matter of the Bhagavad Gita is bhakti or devotional activity. Um, and Krishna will start to, ha has already begun and will continue to emphasize bhakti as the uh, sum of all the other paths and as something that stands alone, that stands on its own uh, as the means by which the results of all the other paths can be realized. So let's take a look back at chapter eight. We began with Arjuna's request for clarification of six different terms. And Krishna replies to those, to Arjuna's request for clarification. So that this will cover verses one through four. The six terms were Brahman, Adhyatma, Karma, Adibhuta, Adidaiva, and Adijagya. Brahman is the imperishable transcendence, and it is also the eternal nature of the living being. So there is this phrase, aham brahmasmi, aham, I, brahmasmi, am Brahman. So in answering this question, Krishna very efficiently puts Brahman and Adhyatma together. Adhyatma is the self beyond the physical metaphysical body whose original nature is Brahman. So Arjuna is asking for clarification of when we say Adhyatma, are we talking about the physical body? Are we talking about the subtle body? Are we talking about something else? And Krishna says, we're talking about something else. We're talking about the uh, spirit, spiritual person whose very nature is to be Brahman, which is the imperishable transcendence. The eternal nature of the living being is Brahman. Karma are, is action that results in the creation of future material bodies. Then the Adi in the next three words, Adi Bhuta, Adi Daiva, Adi Jagya, is significant because Adi means the first or the one above, the one who is ruling over or the ruling principle. So Arjuna is asking about not just the material manifestation, but what is the ruling principle, the governing principle of the material nature? And Krishna defines that nature or that ruling aspect of material nature as perpetual change, as fallibility due to being subject to the influence of time and therefore uh, perpetual change from one state to another state. 
which is why he will later characterize the entire material world from the earthly planet up to Brahma or from the highest to the lowest region of the material world as a place of sorrow because nothing lasts. There is always this element of loss. So Adi Bhutta, uh, perpetual change means coming into being, which is in the mode of passion, the guna of uh, passion or the quality of passion. There is remaining for some time maintenance, which is in the quality of goodness, sattva guna. Then uh, production of byproducts, more creation, which is back in the mode of passion, rajagun, and then going out of being, disappearance, which uh, is in the mode of ignorance, destruction, uh, tamaguna. So those are the four stages of material manifestation. Then Adidaiva, the governing principle uh, of the demigods, of the deities. And Krishna defines this as the person, the Purusha, indicating the universal form of the Lord, the uh, idea that the universe, the material world itself, is the f a form, a divine form. Uh, another way of saying that reality is a person. And you have material reality, of a sense, nested into a greater spiritual reality, and the spiritual reality is more real than the material reality. And then Adi Jagya, the governing principle of sacrifice, which Krishna has already identified uh, as Vishnu, or the Paramatma, the supreme person situated within the heart of all beings. After answering these questions, Krishna answers an additional supplemental question from Arjuna about how the yoga practitioner can know Krishna. Arjuna specifically asks, how can one who has controlled their senses know you at the time of death? And this becomes the overarching uh, theme of this chapter. From verses five through eight, Krishna describes how whatever state of being one remembers at the end of one's life, that state they will carry into their next life. Uh, and one is certain to attain the state of being one's mind is absorbed in at the end of one's life. Therefore, the purpose or the opportunity of the life we currently have is to go cultivate the state of mind we would like to have at the moment of death, assuming that we do not have the kind of expertise in mystic yoga that Krishna has described in the latter verses, that could be any time. We don't know what our karma is. Uh, we don't have the mystic power to control when we leave. We just don't know. So there is a certain sense of urgency for us to cultivate that state of mind on a ongoing basis and try to maintain it as a matter of ongoing yoga practice. So constant remembrance of Krishna will increasingly become the single most important point that Krishna will return to throughout the rest of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, now, sometimes we will hear that the Gita is a book about Dharma, doing the right thing, or a book about duty, uh, you know, or doing what you do without attachment and such like that. Well, the ultimate dharma is to remember Krishna in all circumstances. And this, given the amount of attention that Krishna pays to this uh, urgent message, is clearly uh, the essential message of the Gita, not simply to act with detachment, but to act with detachment while also remembering Krishna. So this is the section of the Gita where Krishna really focuses on himself as the ultimate object of meditation. So in these next verses, 9 through 14, Krishna gives some pretty specific instructions on how to meditate on the Supreme Person 
and uh, how to leave one's body. So in verse 9, Krishna says, one should continuously meditate upon the Supreme Person as the one who is the most wise, the most ancient, the perpetual ruler of all, the ultimate Adi, who is smaller than the smallest and the maintainer of everything, whose form is inconceivable and who is luminous like the sun and transcendental to the darkness of material nature. So getting back to this idea of the ultimate Adi, the perpetual ruler, there's a line that recurs in a sacred text called the Brahma Samhita. Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bhajami. I offer my worship, Bhajami, uh, to Govinda, another name for Krishna. Uh, Govindam Adi Purusham, the original person. Adi, the first Purusha person. So Govinda is the original person. And therefore, uh, the governing principle of all other people, places, and things. So here in this section, we find an interweaving of mystic yoga techniques with descriptions of various possible destinations for the departing yogi. And one of those destinations is elsewhere in the material world, which Krishna describes in verses 16 through 19 as a transient place of sorrows. And we get a description of the Vedic conception of time and space. In verses 20 through 22, by contrast, we hear about the spiritual world as an eternal place where Krishna can be found. Uh, the Sanskrit word of yakta is significant in these verses. It is often translated as unmanifest with the idea that there is no form, no variegatedness, no differentiation of anything. A uh, being a negating prefix, vyakta manifest. So taking this in context, a vyakta uh, does not necessarily mean formless. It can, depends on the context, but unmanifest can also mean you can't see it. You're not, you don't have access to it. If Krishna says, you can come to me in my place, then that means there must be a place where the person, Krishna, is hanging out. And there is a certain unity to Krishna and Krishna's place, but there's also a distinction because otherwise, how can there be a relationship between Krishna, Krishna's place, and the person who is joining Krishna in that place? So there must be some differentiation within the unity. And therefore we have this idea of simultaneous oneness and difference in reconciling the paradox of spiritual existence. Anyone got a question on that or a comment on that? Please go ahead and ask. Verses 23 through 27, tips for mystic yogis who are interested in leaving their body and going to a particular destination. Travel tips for people who are going to leave their body. That should definitely be a subject line for a newsletter because if that's not clickbait, I don't know what is. Anyway, Krishna gets into some detail in the verses that we just covered on when to leave one's body, best times for travel to the Brahma Jyoti, best times to go to the moon. I'm going to do like an SEO search on that just to see, you know, what, pe what keywords people are using when they want to find out, like, what's the best time to go to the moon? And then finally, our last verse of this chapter, 28, uh, a summation of the last two chapters, also echoes 
the last verse of chapter six. Remember at the end of chapter six, just as we now make the transition into the chapters that are focused specifically on devotional yoga, bhakti. Krishna tells Arjuna after giving a rundown of various kinds of yogis, of all yogis, one who abides in him, meaning Krishna, sees Krishna within their heart and renders loving service to Krishna is the highest of all yogis. That's Krishna's opinion. So this last verse, in a way, is going to reiterate this same idea. With a complete understanding, a mystic transcends the fruits to be obtained by the study of the Vedas, performance of sacrifice, observance of austerities, giving of charitable gifts, and reaches the supreme original abode. So surpassing all possible material benefits to be gained by all other practices. Krishna will consistently return to encouragement uh, along these lines, uh, encouragement to transcend material nature uh, and come to him, while at the same time encouraging Arjuna to fight. He's still got his stuff to do in the material world. So it's not like he's saying, blow off the material world and just hang out with me, but rather do that which you are duty bound to do and also hang out with me. Okay, so there you go. So that was our review and our summary of chapter eight, the yoga of attaining, of attaining the supreme. Uh, tonight we talked about knowing when it's time to go, covering the last handful of verses. And we took uh, some time to look back and put the whole chapter together. So if you have any questions, now is a good time to ask them. I've got the Q&A box open. And if you are watching this or listening to this after the fact, you can reach me with any questions or comments that you have at hari at harikirtan.com. And while I anxiously wait for your questions, I'm going to tell you about a special opportunity for yoga teachers. On my website, if you go to books, In Search of the Highest Truth, you will find, of course, my book, In Search of the Highest Truth, Adventures in Yoga Philosophy. And you could, of course, go to Amazon, or um, you could go through IndieBound to purchase my book at your local bookstore. However, I have a special offer for yoga teachers and you can click here for details. Check it out. I'm going to click here and get to the details. So here's the special offer. If you're a yoga teacher and you're doing workshops uh, on yoga philosophy or that integrate yoga philosophy, if you're doing uh, classes where you want to integrate yoga philosophy into your classes, or if you are a director of a yoga teacher training program and you would therefore obviously have yoga philosophy as part of your training program, then you may want to know that uh, for so many years, students asked me when I was teaching yoga philosophy and yoga teacher training programs, uh, is there a book that simply, that, that explains yoga philosophy in a simple and accessible way, and that was fun to read. And I actually couldn't come up with one so I wrote one, and this is it. Now, here's the thing. I also put together a companion teacher's guide that makes it easy for teachers to integrate the contents of my book into their training curriculum or into the theme of a particular workshop or class. So that teacher's guide has a review of key concepts. It's got topics and questions for group discussion, got group exercises, topics for individual contemplation, and personal experiments for individual discovery. So there's stuff to do in the group, in the class, workshop, or teacher training module, and there's stuff to take home for an individual to work with. Uh, and 
my special offer is that you can actually purchase the book directly from me at the same low, low retail price of $14.95. That's the same price you would pay uh, at Amazon or through your local bookstore or anywhere else. But if you purchase it directly through me on my website, then not only will I send you my companion teacher's guide for free as a PDF file, but as an added bonus, I'll send it for you to you for free. No shipping if you live in the United States of America. If you live somewhere else, email me and we'll work something out. Um, and if you already have the book, then just contact me on my website. You can go to the contact page of my website. And you can fill out this form and say, I already bought your dumb book. Send me the, the uh, teacher's companion and then I'll send it to you. You can also just write to me at Hari at harikiritan.com. That works just as well. Uh, but either way, uh, if you already have a copy of my book, I'll be happy to send you the guide for uh, the teacher's companion for absolutely free. And if you do not yet have my book, uh, what are you waiting for? Now you, now you have all the more reason to uh, buy a nice book about yoga philosophy. All right, there you go. I think our time is just about up. Uh, your request, Shana, is duly noted. Uh, yeah, asking me right now in the Q&A if you are live, uh, that's, that's another good way to um, make that happen. Although you may be relying on my memory at your own risk if you do it that way. But anyway, it's still possible. Okay. Uh, I think my work is done here. I'm very, very happy to have been able to spend this time with you. Very honored that you have chosen to spend this time with me. And I look forward to hearing from any and all of you after the fact for questions and comments about this chapter. Uh, oh, I think uh, there's more, but wait, there is more. Next week, I'll be back. Uh, what? I could have sworn I got this right this time. No, next week, we're not doing this. And next week, I'm gonna actually make sure I have what's gonna happen next week on the slide. Next week, what we're actually going to do, oh boy, we're going to move on to chapter nine, the yoga of royal secrets, otherwise known as the most confidential knowledge or the king of knowledge. We will look at different levels of confidential knowledge. We will look at uh, the qualification for hearing confidential knowledge. We will learn about knowledge of relationships and the ins and outs of being God. We will cover verses one through nine of chapter nine. Okay, that is all she wrote. And that's the end of our class for this evening. So thank you very, very much for joining me. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a nice night.